Um, yes, yeah, so continuous integration for ROS in commercial environments. Um, some people may or may not actually be familiar with uh, what continuous integration is, so we'll cover that first. Um, mainly here you're looking at sort of, you want to do basically three things. You want to build your software, you want to test your software, and you probably want to deploy it. Uh, most people in the room are probably most familiar with the deployment aspect where your you know, pseudo app get install something. Well, that software had to come from somewhere and has to be packaged up. And in Rossland, the way we do that is by building Debian releases from these git build package repositories, um, which are created by Bloom, a uh, tool Will Woodall wrote that you've probably all interacted with at some point if you've released a ROS package. Um, on the build aspect, um, one of the things that you may want to run it, that you run into and you want to really know is that do you actually, if you build this in a clean environment, does it actually work? Um, as a developer, you may do all sorts of funky things on your computer and then you go and give it to somebody else and it doesn't work the same way. Um, so one of the things that your continuous integration system will do is actually test to make sure that it actually works on a clean system. Uh, and then the test aspect is after you've built that on that clean system, does it pass those tests? Um, so some of you may be familiar with the ROS.org build farm. If you've ever released a Debian or you've set up a documentation job, some of the auto-generated stuff that goes up on the wiki, um, you've interacted with this. And this system is powered by Jenkins, um, which is a very, it, you know, it's a great continuous integration system, but there's a lot to it. It's quite a bit work to set up. Um, you saw with like Austin's uh, talk earlier, he was talking about you know months or actually like two years worth of setup to get you know all of their stuff up and running. Um, and and this system has evolved pretty much with Ross all along. So it's changed, you know, and and whatnot. Um, but this system does uh, three things. So it builds those Debian packages. Uh, it builds your documentation and it runs those devel jobs, which is sort of, you know, every time uh, on this little diagram I've got, you sort of, you've got two different repos generally. So you'd start with that source repository, which is where you're putting all your source code. It's got all your uh, packages, you know, you got your CMake list, you got your package.xml in there. Um, and if you set up one of these devel jobs, every time you commit to that main branch, it'll actually on the build farm about an hour later usually, uh, you know, basically it triggers on the hour. So if you do that commit right at like 12.59, it'll probably build in like five minutes. But if you do it at one, uh, like 101, uh, you're gonna be waiting like an hour before it triggers and hopefully the farm's not too busy. Um, but it'll build your system and then it'll run those tests. And you'll get an email if it, you know, didn't work. Um, so that's sort of that first line of defense of, oh, I just totally broke the build, I should go fix that. Um, the second pipeline here is that when you do a release using Bloom, uh, you'll actually put that into a new repository, uh, which is this git build package repository, or GBP. And a lot of these are hosted on the GitHub organization, uh, Ross GBP. There's like hundreds of these in there. They've got dozens of branches and all sorts of things going on. And basically, that's all the information that says how to take the code that you've written and, and build it into these uh, Debian's on all the different operating systems that Ross is currently supporting, which you know for uh, Indigo is uh, Ubuntu Saucy and Ubuntu Trusty, so you've got two operating systems, and then they're building each on i386 and uh, x64. So it's actually going to build four different things from your one source repository, um, and so you end up putting that into that Git build package. And then the trigger for that is when you release, okay, it's gonna rebuild your thing. But the other thing that happens is if somebody releases something that you depend on, it'll end up rebuilding your devs so that they definitely work on there. Um, you know, we, as developers, we should strive to have that, uh, you know, that we, we have binary compatibility uh, for any ROS package that's 1.0 or later. Um, the reality is, is that in ROS land, that's rarely the case, um, maybe on the lower level stuff, but certainly above a certain point, um, the binary compatibility is just out the window, and so everything gets rebuilt each time. You know, every, everything above your package will be rebuilt so that if you change your binary compatibility, it, that'll work. Uh, you know, their, their package won't be busted. So what are some of the common issues with that, using that main build farm if, if you're a developer, particularly in a commercial operation, and you want to 
uh, build your stuff and get that same set of uses? Well, the first one, and this is the one that was one of the biggest problems for myself, uh, that this, uh, I'm gonna talk about a package that was developed at Unbounded Robotics, and so we had private repositories. Even things that were going to eventually be open source, um, we didn't want to have them open while we were doing our development and whatnot. You know, we want to have it clean afterwards. And so if you even just want to take the Jenkins build farm, deploy it on your own and get it going, there's all sorts of things that just don't work with private repositories for you. Um, the turnaround time that I mentioned, um, if you hit on the hour or slightly after, uh, you know, it could be up to an hour or something. If, if the, if the if somebody's just released a new version of ROS into, say, Groovy or Hydro, and it's got to rebuild all 1,500 packages, your farm could be totally slammed, and it may be two or three days before you actually get the response of like, yes, the build worked, or no, the build didn't. Um, obviously, Austin's already set up a build farm for ARM, you know, because that wasn't on there, right? So if you've got a new architecture, and it's not one of the ones that uh, OSRF is hosting, well, you can't release to that. Um, and then, even if you meet all the need, if, if the Jenkins farm meets all the needs, um, it's really complex. There's, there's config files in all sorts of different languages. There's not a ton of documentation. There's only, you know, basically you, you end up having to bug, you know, Austin and Tully and whatnot, and those guys are busy. So, um, it's not always easy to get all the answers. Um, so, something that I created to try and fix this, and that has actually gotten quite a bit of adoption already, is BuildBot Ross. And so when I started on this, um, basically, you know, we had these couple of goals at the beginning. And the first one was that it should be easy to config. Um, and in particular, um, I'm, I'm sort of a coder, I'm not really an IT specialist. So IT was using all these crazy bash scripts and this and that, you had no idea what was going on. There's like a config language for Jenkins called Groovy. Um, you know, I didn't want to learn Groovy. Uh, so BuildBot, the BuildBot package itself is this entirely Python system for building continuous integration systems. And so this is built on top of it, and it means that I can do all of my configuration using only Python code, and not that much of it actually, but unless I want to extend something, and the ROS distro format, which is just a series of YAMLs, and YAML is used all over inside ROS. Um, if, you've, if you've ever done any release of anything, uh, you know, setting up a doc job on the wiki, uh, putting out Debian packages or running one of those test jobs, then you have interacted with ROS distro. Um, it's just a series of YAML files you put in your config. Um, we also wanted to have you know, fairly good documentation on this so that it was easy to reproduce. Um, even for me as the developer, because you, know, you set up a build farm and then you know, if everything's working, you don't come back to it until that machine crashes or like you have to rebuild the machine or you're moving to a new OS. Um, and so a year, year and a half later, you have no idea what you did a year ago. So documentation is critical um, even for the development team. Um, wanted to support those same, you know, building devs, building docs, and uh, building the uh, devel jobs. And support all these sort of private repositories, even having a private ROS distro. So you can have an entirely private setup on the side and be running these things alongside and then install them with your regular raw stuff. Um, so as I said, implementation-wise, it's built on top of BuildBot, which is a fairly widely used, uh, easy to set up continuous integration tool. It's, it's not as sort of fully featured as Jenkins, but at the same time, it does a lot more sort of right out of the box. Um, and you pretty much do your config entirely in Python. So it's really nice for if you're a Python dev, it's quick to get it running. Um, for building the devs, we use uh, Cow Builder to load those devs in. We use a tool called Rep RepoPro. These are both the same things that are being used on the ROS build farm. They're just generic packages that are out there in the world. Uh, maybe the ROS is using PBuilder. I'm not sure the older version. But anyways, that's a detail. It doesn't matter. Um, and then there's this Python ROS distro package, which gives you uh, all of your parsing of the ROS distro in the exact same way that the ROS build farm is going to do it, or that you as a developer, if you want to interact with the ROS distro, you can get to that easily. So the configuration is basically you set up your ROS distro. So there's the generic ROS distro that's out there that's building all of the world of ROS that you're normally downloading. Um, you could point at that ROS distro, but that thing's huge. You know, if you're building you know, 1,500 packages on Hydro, uh, it's going to take a little while. Um, and then basically updating the Python configuration to point at this ROS distro. And you can add all sorts of other configs in there as well. 
the default configuration that if you, you know, check out the repo, you got to update the one line to point at your ROS distro, but that whole file's really only about 120 lines of Python, and that sets up sort of a one computer system uh, for building. So it's, you know, if you're a developer sitting there at your desktop, you can have this thing running in the background, and you know, as soon as you commit, you'll end up getting, you know, oh, you broke the build or whatnot. If you've got a small team, you can run on one machine in house, and it's, uh, it's pretty quick to get set up and running. Um, so again, you know, why would you want this? Well, if you aren't, if you don't have a lot of IT support, you know, particularly if it's a startup or whatnot, and you are your own IT support, um, you know, it's pretty easy to get up and going. Um, you get that faster turnaround, um, and. Actually, the BuildBot raw system, we've also got set up so that you can build just generic Git build packages. So um, right now, if you want to bring in something that's not a ROS package, typically you either release it to Ubuntu or you release it on, say, Launchpad, and uh, then have Tully import it into the uh, ROS uh, Debian repositories. Um, you'll be able to do that yourself, so that if you've built something, and then you know, even, even at this point, um, I have... Uh, some packages that I've released that are on the Ross build farm, we can't actually update them anymore because uh, Saucy, they tore down the build farm already. Um, so there's, there's things already gone, you can't actually update it, but you could on a build bot. Um, so this is kind of the view of what it looks like. You know, it sort of has this waterfall view as their, their main viewer. There's a whole bunch of different viewers. Um, works really well for sort of smaller projects. Um, we don't have a viewer yet that really works great for, I want to build all 1,500 packages in ROS. Um, and then for a single job, you can sort of look at it and look at all the different steps, all the information that was going on, and figure out, um, you know, well, in this particular one, it, it succeeded, everything built, so that's great. Um, if there's a lot of red on there, you can figure out where the red started and go back and fix it. Um, as always, there are some limitations. Um, in particular, there's one that's sort of baked into BuildBot itself, um, which is that it really can only query about uh, a thousand unique names going back and forth. Uh, you can actually bump that up with a little monkey patch that can be applied um, to, into the BuildBot Python code. It's easy to update you know, at runtime. Um, but a thousand unique jobs, uh, you may run into that at some point, although you're probably also like that, that's a lot of jobs to be running. Um, when I use this, I typically don't, I don't want to rebuild all of ROS, right? I mean, that's, that's eating up a lot of processor time. It's causing me to be separate from the main farm. So I'm usually just building a few packages of my own stuff on top of the regular uh, Debians that are on the OSRF build farm. Um, and one of the other things we have is that it doesn't currently automatically re reconfigure when you update your ROS distro. Um, so that's, that's some of the future work there. A um, couple of recommendations that we've come along uh, in using this is that uh, we actually found uh, using SSDs uh, on, on the cow builders actually gets you like a big speed up. Obviously, it's also doing a lot of writes to the, the SSDs, so you're going to burn them up at some point. Um, but like a two to three x speed up, which is really good when you're trying to do those test jobs, because now you know you might get a turnaround in like a minute or something. You find out that like oh, all your tests have failed. Um, uh, that same thousand package set up there um, is, you know, sort of doing one, uh, you know, there's, there's only the one Jenkins farm, um, but you could also have multiple build bots set up on the same machine and set up one for Groovy, one for Hydra, one for Indigo, and then, you know, if you're only building on one architecture, you can get around this, even if you've got, like, a lot of packages, you can get around the thousand limit pretty easily there. Um, and currently I use it just a cron job to restart the farm periodically, which kicks it and gets it to look at my ROS distro. But if, you know, if you're just a small team working in-house, you don't tend to release, you know, all the, the test jobs running when you commit, that'll happen automatically, you don't need to restart the thing. You don't tend to do a lot of, like, Debian releases, like, every day. So even if that only runs twice a day, you'll get your new Debs, you know, by the end of the day. Um, couple of sort of configuration things to try and make the setup even easier. Um, Mike Purvis, who was just up here, has actually been using BuildBot ROS for a while now. He's one of the earlier users, and um, he actually has released some stuff for uh, using Ansible to sort of set up clear, uh, not, don't talk that one up. 
Okay. Well, anyways, I, I've got a link in here later. I guess don't don't look at that. Maybe that's out of date. Um, uh, I've actually been doing a bunch of work recently with uh, using Docker to to deploy this. Um, which means that now I can just run my Docker script on my local desktop, and I can actually run a second build farm. So I, you know, I have my main build farm that's off running on the side that's doing stuff. I have my second local copy that's like running really hard on the background in my desktop, and I'm getting my test results really quick. Um, there are a bunch of examples of how to deploy this using Docker um, in the BuildBot Ross uh, repo. There's a documentation folder. Um, future work. Uh, so I'm actually, I, I had this initially said, you know, like in progress for the GitHub build, uh, pull request builder. It's, it's almost in progress. Um, I didn't actually get to it this week, but next week I'll actually be working on this a bit. Um, so that, uh, because it's, I, I'm the maintainer on the navigation stack and people keep opening pull requests and every time I have to pull that down I have to run all the tests and see if it works. And so uh, the Ross build farm doesn't yet, and, and these guys are swamped coming up with Ross 2.0, doesn't yet do uh, sort of the pull work. Every time somebody opens a pull request, you automatically build that. So uh, we should have that in BuildBot Ross hopefully by the end of next week. Um, one of the other things that um, hopefully we'll be doing in the future is with this, uh, uh, with Docker, it's, it's really nice. You can sort of build in your new, you know, replacement for change route, all these sort of things. Um, and, and there's also potentially a uh, replacement for the cow builders, which should hopefully be faster to build those devs, because building devs is still a little bit slow on their uh, startup and shutdown and whatnot. Um, and better visualization, uh, particularly for when you've got a lot more packages uh, in the system. Uh, so the, most of these are covered by some sort of ticket that's on our uh, uh, GitHub project, uh, which, if you're looking for, is uh, github.com, uh, my name, and then that's the main repository. There's actually quite a few forks at this point. Um, I guess ignore that second one. Um, I didn't talk to Mike ahead of time. It's okay. Um, and I've got a couple of thanks here. Uh, Mike Purvis and Mike Co uh, from ClearPath and Mike Koval from CMU have both been really awesome, uh, contributing stuff back, you know, pointing out things, uh, and uh, they really helped me debug all the documentation quite a bit. So thanks to you guys. And uh, that's what I've got, so I guess uh, questions? Pretty close. Uh, so in that example file, it basically has, I don't know, I think there's some slightly different things about Docker with AWS. I don't know the details on that. Um, there's an example Docker file that basically like you would fill in a few things. Um, one of the things that I do with this is that, uh, and this is a huge security hole, but um, I like, I, you know, a private repos on GitHub, you end up with, you need your, your key for the SSH. I actually just put that into a new repo that's in there, and then I, my Docker just loads that in. And so basically every time I'm like setting up a new machine, once I have those couple of files in there and I have them pointing at the right names, um, I can redeploy it on multiple machines really, really fast and not have to track down all these things. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, you know, if you fill in a couple of lines and whatnot, um, the, the Docker setup is actually, it, it does all the steps and whatnot to do that, so. Um, but you will have to probably put it into a repo somewhere. Uh, I haven't used really big farms. I've mainly had, you know, one or two, um, you know, it's, I haven't done a lot of that. I haven't had any problems with those couple of uh, builders wandering off on me, um, and I have run it across multiple machines, um, but always in the same building. So there could still be issues if you're sort of uh, doing like uh, the OSRF farm does right now, where it's up in the cloud somewhere and, you know, connectivity issues wandering around. Um, you, you might still have problems. They've, I know they've done quite a bit of, I don't know how long ago that was, but I know they've done quite a bit of work to try and improve that. That has actually been one of the things where there was a, quite a bit of work in there because they rewrote some of the way that protocol works. 